last presentation, uh, Larry touched a little bit on it, and it's uh, called Effective Use of Boards and Advisory Boards. Uh, I'm going to welcome Brian Tucker, publisher and edit editorial director of Cleveland, of Crane's Cleveland Business, who will monitor a panel, panel discussion and introduce our panel. Thanks. Well, this is terrific. <clears throat> Normally, I get the great luck of being stuck as the speaker before the cocktail party. Rarely do I get stuck as, a, as the moderator of a panel before the cocktail party at an Indians playoff game. <laughs> and you probably have had a long afternoon, although I'm sure it's been a terrific one. I am not going to spend a lot of time on the bios. They're in your book. You can read them as well as I can. If you're like me, and oh, by the way, um, Larry, that was a terrific presentation. One of my pet peeves is when people have great PowerPoints and they stand in front of an audience and read every single word of the PowerPoint. Um, but briefly to my immediate right, Stan Gorham is a partner and a member of the Board of Directors and a chair of the business practice at Han Loser and Park full-service law firm here in Cleveland with offices in Ohio, Florida, Indiana, and California. Ron Sansom is the managing partner of Corman, Jackson, and Kranz, a Cleveland-based securities, commercial finance, and corporate law practice. To his right is Mark Kranz, the managing partner of Corman, Jackson, and Kranz. And on the end is Rod Howell, the CEO and co-founder of Libra Industries, an electronics manufacturing service provider in Mentor, Ohio. This is meant to be interactive. It's meant to bring you value. So uh, make sure that if you have a, a question at any time, uh, let me know. Just raise your hand. Uh, be a part of this process, because that's the best way to, to get value. We are here to talk about advisory boards. How do you use them? How do you create them? What are the pros and cons to having them? Best practices for successful boards? Uh, all of this sort of thing. I know Rod has some experience, and I know some of the others on the panels have experiences with their clients as well as probably serving on boards of them of advisors or directors themselves. So to start, I'm just curious in the audience with a show of hands, who currently at their uh, company has a board of advisors with non-family members? Yeah, about 15, 20%, it's pretty good. So for the entire panel, um, probably the first and best question might be the appropriate process for an owner who doesn't have an advisory board to consider and prepare for the whole decision to establish a board. I mean, you, first, of, first, if, first off, you have to be committed. You have to, I guess you have to, you have to believe that it adds value to your business. So how do you go about that process? And we'll go right down the down the line here. Well, maybe can we ask one other question real quick? How many ha uh, work for an employer that has a board of directors? Yeah, okay, the majority. All right, it helps us know sort of where you're at. Um, I can start on this question and then everybody can add. I think the most important part of the process of deciding whether you want a board and what kind of board is asking the first question, which is what are you trying to accomplish? You know, if you're looking for help with new ideas, uh, you want to bounce issues off of someone, but you're not necessarily looking for help with managing the company, then you're likely talking about an advisory board in some fashion, and they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. If you're looking for help actually managing the enterprise, and there's lots of reasons you may do that, and you actually want help making those kinds of binding decisions that a board makes, then you're looking at a board of directors on a 50,000-foot view. Others? Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, it sounds like most of you have uh, advisory boards or board of directors, so it's nothing new for most of you. But 
you know, I, I would encourage you to talk to others in this room who have, uh, who have boards. If you don't, uh, talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. I don't think there's any uh, bad time to consider a board. Uh, a board can only help you. Um, you. You know, if it's not doing what you expect, uh, then get rid of the board members, uh, replace them, or um, uh, dissolve the board altogether. Uh, but it's not going to hurt you. So I don't, I don't think there's any, you know, best time to do it. I, I think it's, it's always a good time to look to, uh, at establishing a board. Mark? And I, I'd actually start a little bit back from where, uh, where Stan was. Um, I think uh, as CEOs uh, of companies, uh, including myself, we, we, all, we all know what is best for our own company, and many, many times uh, we don't believe anybody else can help us, and no, no one else can tell us what is right for our company. So I, I really think the first place for those of you who don't have an, either an advisory board or formal board of directors is really to look in the mirror and think about whether you're willing to listen to somebody uh, tell you maybe what's going wrong or what could be better uh, about, in, uh, about your company, what you're doing and what your company is doing. So that's where I would start. Um, I uh, concur with everything that's been said thus far, but also I would add that, you know, we've had a board now for almost 15 years, and I can honestly say that there is no downside to having a board. I mean, you can only win by having a board. But the other important thing um, that I think any business owner needs to <clears throat> do before they start a board is do a little soul searching and um, make sure that it's clear in their mind, as uh, I think it was Stan earlier mentioned, what, what's your objective, what are you hoping to achieve? But then also, I think the bigger, more difficult or challenging issue is how open are you going to be? In other words, you have to be at peace with yourself as the owner of the business to be willing to openly share information. Uh, in other words, create a culture of, uh, of openness and willingness to share and participate with this board. Otherwise, I think you're just wasting your time. I know it sounds easy, but uh, for all of us in this room that have private businesses, it sometimes can be uh, very difficult to get over that initial hurdle of, you know, how much information do I share with my board members? You know, what do I allow them to see? What don't I allow them to see? From my perspective, my board members see 100% of what I see. Uh, they have basically the, the keys to the whole company if they want. Um, and it, I didn't start day one from that, so it, it takes a little while to get there, but you know, you, you need to ask yourself that question is, am I willing, able, and am I truly ready to basically open up and share all this information? Okay, by show of hands, how many here are at a publicly held company? Oh, not very many. Then all, all of you mostly are privately held companies. So I will uh, throw out a hypothetical to the panel. Uh, I'm a business owner. I'm the second generation in a family-owned business. I have SIBs in the business, but I'm the president. They don't want a board. I want a board. What do you do? Well, I, I can start again. They're, They're rushing to ask, <laughs> answer this question. Well, I think. Part of the issue is there's, there are so many, there. right, we've all been there, and there are so many pieces and parts to this. I, maybe you said it, Brian, I missed it. Do the siblings have ownership? Do they own shares in their own name uh, or in trusts or well, whatever? Let's, let's say that they do. Yeah. Um, and then it's a question of how much. Uh, you know, typically you will have the situation where one of the siblings becomes sort of the lead and the other siblings, for the most part, will follow that person. So I think, you know, echoing the earlier comments, you're, you're going to advise that person to do everything they can and meet separately with the other siblings to explain to them why it's important that they have a board. It's a little easier conversation when some of the siblings aren't involved, um, and it's, it goes to an issue that I'm sure we'll get into later, and, and you all are fairly familiar with this anyway, is that putting a board of directors in place means that those individuals have a fiduciary obligation to all of the shareholders. 
So that can be an effective uh, argument to some of these reluctant siblings that, you know, we can bring in independent people and they have an obligation to you as well as to the other shareholders and they can help to protect, you know, the interests of the company and the shareholders as a whole. Ron, to start. you, with all of the companies that Riverside buys and sells and operates, uh, I'm sure you've hit this wall from time to time. Yeah, I would say, first of all, uh, sell your company to Riverside, <laughs> <laughs> and then we will help you solve this problem uh, with the siblings. Uh, we, we, uh, honestly, we don't see a lot of this. I mean, once a company makes the decision to sell, uh, then they understand very early on that we're going to establish a board of directors. So we don't see a lot of, uh, truly, honestly, we don't see a lot of sibling uh, infighting on that sort of thing. Um, being a family member doesn't mean you're automatically on the board. If you're a family member and you're in an executive position, a position of, uh, of some responsibility in the company, then, then uh, we would invite you to be on the board. But uh, we, we honestly don't see a lot of that sibling uh, issue when, once the company's made the decision to sell. And I think just if you take your, uh, your hypothetical, Brian, in, in that case, maybe it, maybe it is a good example of a case where an advisory board as opposed to a board of directors is really the place to start. We haven't really gotten to what the, what the main differences are between a, a, a board and an advisory board. But put simply, and uh, I put in your, uh, your packets a, a form letter that uh, we've used from time to time with advisory boards. That letter is uh, purely legal. It doesn't have the... Uh, any of the uh, the fluff and the addition that you want to you know really get out about you know why someone should be on your board, what advantages you, you know, that you believe the person can join. So just really view it as just the the legal piece and not by any means intended to be the the whole letter that would go out. Uh, but the key really is in the in the first paragraph of that letter, which makes it very clear that uh, the advisory board, either any member of that advisory board or the or the group as a whole has absolutely no authority whatsoever to bind the company. And that's really a critical point. It is the critical point, it's the real critical distinction legally uh, between an advisory board and a board of directors. Stan was talking about the fiduciary duty of a board to all the shareholders of a board of directors. The advisory board has no fiduciary duty to, to anyone, no duty, no obligation uh, 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 to the company. And that really is the distinction, so maybe a way to to sell uh, to the uh, to the reluctant siblings is we'll just let's test drive this let's get give uh, uh, bring in some people um, and maybe they can help us and uh, you, you do th do that for a year or two and maybe at that point you decide you uh, you really want a uh, a board in place to uh, uh, a formal board of directors to, uh, to help the company move forward. Just to take off on one piece that Mark was talking about and it's important when you look at the materials that he supplied in the. Uh, in your packet. Um, because an advisory board does not have any legal obligation to the entity, you really want to be certain that if you're going to set up such a board and you're going to use them, that you sign a confidentiality agreement with those people. And Mark's materials has those provisions in it. I inter interrupted you, Rod. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I, I want to relate a personal experience, a little bit different twist to your question, Brian. But I'm also on a board of a, uh, a fairly large private organization in excess of 300 million, and it's going through uh, a transfer from one generation to the next. And we've very effectively used the board of advisors in helping bring in the next generation. Uh, the next generation, there are two family members that have been added to this board of advisors, so they, in conjunction with the uh, original board of advisors, I think have, have done a great job educating the kids on the business, the dynamics, uh, all the, the things that go on um, day to day as well as strategically and have been, a fan, I think, a fantastic buffer between the dad and the children as they start to transition this business because, as you know, any of you who are involved in family businesses, um, it, it can be... Um, I'm not sure what the best word is, but it, it's extremely challenging. You never leave the business. Every discussion at home always somehow circles back around to uh, the business. So by having this buffer, outside experts, professionals, whatever you want to call them, uh, has, I think, added tremendous value not only to the business, 
but has really made this transition process much smoother and I think more effective for both the, uh, the founding generation and the, the next generation that's taking over. So, there, I'm sorry, there are actually professionals who specialize in this, um, who have degrees in psychology and things like that, who can come in and help to mediate between generations, like the situation we're talking about. So, so we can add the creation of an advisory board to the, the ugly things that you're not supposed to watch, like making politics and making sausage? Is that, <laughs> is that um, to the two attorneys on the, on the uh, panel, um, what's your best, how do you best advise a business owner who is considering creating a board? Doesn't know whether he or she wants a board of advisors, a board of directors, doesn't, you know, but just knows that there's a need somehow. Do you get involved in that counseling kind of uh, situation and, and help them in some way or another? We actually get involved in that quite a bit. I'll just uh, give an example. We do a fair amount of work with uh, uh, startup companies uh, and uh, really universally in, in those cases where uh, they are raising outside capital so the founders of the company don't have enough money themselves to really get things going, but they've gone to, uh, uh, it may just be uh, family and friends, but uh, it's also be beyond that uh, and have raised capital, not to the extent of going to a private equity firm like Riverside or even a, a, a venture capital firm, but just uh, through a pl private placement of ra raise some money. We recommend in every single one of those cases that they, uh, uh, that they have a, a real board of directors, not even an advisory board. Um, and in fact, we won't, we won't even take the assignment on uh, unless the, uh, the, the clients have agreed to do that. And it's really uh, for, for several reasons. When you, ha you have the startup and all the ups and downs and going back to uh, uh, the, the first uh, PowerPoint this morning with uh, the way innovation works and the, uh, and, and the uh, lineup not being a straight one, that's certainly true for startup companies. Uh, and really our experience is that you need that board of directors there uh, to advise the company, to uh, help uh, not just uh, with the business advice, but to uh, uh, smooth things out with the, uh, with, with the investors as well, so the investors know that there's somebody else there looking over uh, the company, looking over their investment. So, Mark, let me just clarify. So, so do you make that, you make a board of directors a condition of taking the assignment? In that case where they've taken uh, outside capital, absolutely. Yeah. Stan? In our experience, it's the same. Uh, it's rare, unless it's a sole proprietor, that an enterprise does not have a board of directors, and you saw the show of hands here. Board of directors are far more uh, common than advisory boards. Um, and you may see more advisory boards when you are talking about sole proprietors because to create a board is to give up some control. Even if you have the ability to replace it, you have to go through that process. You have to present certain things to the board. And so if you already control 100%, you may, and, and we're talking about, again, probably smaller enterprises that don't have significant outside uh, funding. Um, then you may create an advisory board. I, I just wanted to mention, and most of you are probably familiar with this, um, it, it to some extent doesn't matter anymore what type of entity you organize under, you can still have a board of directors. You know, traditionally that had always been the governing body of a corporation, and it still is. But with uh, LLCs and even partnerships now, you can also have boards of directors. You write them into the organic documents, the operating agreement of an LLC or a partnership. For instance, our firm is a partnership, but we have a board of directors. It's written into the partnership agreement. So it's, it's a governance mechanism that's certainly widely available across different entity types now. Okay. Ron, how about from, from your vantage point, um, is it board of directors or board of advisors? Board of directors. Board of Directors. Yes, so you right. want governance assistance in your portfolio company. That's right. That's right. I mean, I think Mark uh, laid it out pretty well. But from a Board of Directors standpoint, it's important, very important for us um, to, to have a, uh, a couple of good outside Board Directors to help us uh, in terms of the strategic path of the company. I mean, that's what we're really after. Okay. Um, I want to remind you that 
we are taking questions from the audience, so don't, don't be shy if you have, yes, sir. Yeah, I've got a quick question. We're a uh, distributor, 100% ESOP. We do have board of directors, and we're looking at the possibility of starting an advisory board. Um, what kind of advice can you give us as far as finding qualified candidates that could be on the, the advisory board? I know, you know, I understand networking and people that we know, but, you know, is there a group of uh, people or any advisors out there that, you know, we could maybe hook up with? You want to distribute your card so you can get some names? From the <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, it is interesting. One of the sources, uh, this, I guess earlier this afternoon, we heard from uh, Ray at Jumpstart. If you go to their website, they actually have very good material on uh, advisory boards, how you create one, and then uh, they have a, a mechanism to help identify people who can serve on that board. But as Mark was alluding to, I think most people probably look to their professional advisors, uh, their accountants, their lawyers, the other people that they deal with and that they, you know, in the day-to-day -day operations look to for advice, for names, if it's not those individuals, the names of others who could serve in that capacity. I think often if you um, ask people in, you know, non-competitive businesses, but folks that you trust, uh, whether it's in your industry or in your region or in your community, I think you can often find some, some interesting names, too. There's a question over here. Before, before we go on, oh. let me just follow up on that. You know, implicit in your question, and I don't know you or your company, but is that there's something beyond the board of directors that your company is looking for. And I, I don't know what that is, but I would, I would just say, let's, let's say it's marketing, right? Uh, so maybe what, you're, what you really need to do there is if you're looking for a marketing person or persons on, on, your, uh, uh, on your advisory board because you're not getting that input from your board of directors, you know, I'd start looking at, there's some very good marketing firms in town. You know, you, what are your contacts and who do you, you go to there and, and start really look, look, looking at it that way. And the other, the other place that where, where there's been, our clients have had a lot of success is retired uh, uh, business people, in this case a marketing executive, just who really are willing to give the time and the effort uh, uh, to be on an advisory board. Yes, sir. Um, could you please uh, speak about uh, the compensation of these individuals and um, are advisory boards different and board of directors different and how they're compensated and you know what you would be expecting like the gentleman over here is going to be creating one you know what you would be anticipating to start one or maybe a, maybe a range of what you've experienced yeah, from I, sure low to high happy to uh, start uh, First of all, from a, a board of advisors perspective, uh, there, there is no right or wrong amount. Again, it, it goes back to the question of what am I looking to get out of the board? What kind of people do I need to surround myself with? Uh, I think you're going to find that the right people that will serve on a board of advisors in probably 80, 90 percent of the case, they're not there for the money. They're there to help if you've truly selected the right ones. Now, the, the stipend that you're going to give them obviously is appreciated, uh, but that's really not why they're there. Um, in our history, I mean, we've, we've paid, I think, in the early years when we started about 14 years ago, um, we might have been paying $1,500 a meeting, and we have four meetings a year. Uh, now that's up to um, three thousand dollars a meeting, and we still have four. But again, it's—I don't think it's so much the dollars that you're paying. There's—I know I have friends, business owners that pay more. I have uh, friends and, and owners that pay less. Uh, frequency of the meetings is another question uh, um, that sometimes comes up. We personally like to have four. I serve on other boards that have four three and two. Um, maybe three is, is the magic number, I don't know, but you need to get together often enough so that uh, everything is still relevant and then 
you, you kind of tie the compensation into, I, at least I like to tie it into the meetings themselves. So if you have more meetings, obviously you're gonna pay them more. Yeah, I, I agree with Rod. Um, uh, there's no real right answer here. Uh, I can give you our parameters. Typically it's, uh, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that, Rod, that your numbers, because <laughs> ours are generally between 2,500 and 5,000 per meeting. And it, it varies by company and complexity, et cetera. Uh, but that's generally the, the, the scale. Um, in terms of, uh, you can offer stock options. Uh, we, we generally don't do that at Riverside, um, but it's certainly possible that you can do that. Typically when we go to a stock option award, it's if we're asking a board member to execute a specific part of the strategy of the company. We've done that a bit. Uh, I've done it twice, I've been chairman uh, of, of a couple of companies at Riverside, and in one case provided options for, for this individual who executed a specific marketing strategy. Uh, we just exited that company, by the way. Those options were valuable. He, he uh, turned those over to a charity, which I thought was great. Uh, the second time was with a, a lady on our board who I asked to actually develop a product line for one of our businesses. Uh, in that case, we did a more of a consulting agreement with her. It was a cash, more of a cash comp, in addition to the board fees. So whenever we ask, it's not real common that we'll ask the director to, to execute a piece, a, a part of our strategy, but when that happens, then we can, you know, then we can uh, amp it up just a little bit. But that's generally uh, what we do. We also have four meetings um, a year. It's pretty standard across, uh, across Riverside. But, I, but I, I would guess that a payment is important because you want them to consider this uh, no matter how much they might be personally committed to the idea of helping your company, you, you want it to be a business, a business trans, a transaction. You want right. them to be That's committed right. and right. think of it as, exactly. as an assignment that they take seriously. Exactly right. Yeah, my point though was they shouldn't be there solely for the money. Right. If, if, right. if that's why they're there, then I don't think you have the right individual. A piece of this is tied to the fiduciary duty. I mean, part of the fiduciary duty of a board of director is the duty of care. And so they have to undertake, or they're supposed to undertake, a certain amount of work to be prepared for the board meetings, review the materials, meaningfully participate at those meetings, asking questions of management, considering the answers. And so that takes time. And that's part of what you're trying to do, is compensate, hopefully, these very valuable people that you were able to get on your board for the time that they're giving up. Yes, sir. Ron, at Riverside, uh, is there a, a sharing of uh, best practices for your boards across your portfolio companies and do the, do the outside board members come together and sort of focus on what your bigger goals are and so that uh, you can do a better job? There is. Um, we have uh, one large meeting every year called our Leadership uh, summit where we bring all of our CEOs, CFOs, and outside directors together. So it's kind of a big operating meeting, if you will. Um, in, that, in that session, we always have an outside board director session um, where all the outside board directors get together and we talk about best practices. Um, we just kind of went a couple of years ago to start to try and develop best practices from the board. Um, because our outside board directors, um, you know, we expect them to be active. Uh, that's, that's the one word I would describe that when we ask you to, to be on a board is to be active. We're, we're not asking you to be on a board to give you something to do at your, your, the later part of your career or whatever stage of career you're in. We, we expect you to be active. Um, and so uh, for that, the, the, the board directors then, when, when they get together, they're, uh, they're expecting something from us. Um, and, and that comes in board practices, that comes from um, scheduling the meetings, uh, little things that are important to them. You know, getting the materials in advance, we talked about this earlier, very important to them. They don't want to come to the meeting, get the materials, and, and then have to try to analyze numbers while they're in the meeting. That, that irks them, you know, so we try to make, make that kind of thing happen. Um, and, and several other things that we're trying to do, you know, just from a best practice standpoint. But yeah, it does come up. We do try to get our group together at least once a year. We're looking at trying to do that uh, more often. Uh, but it's, it's, it, it gets to be expensive uh, at times as well, but, but yes, yes. Sure. So um, I think typically, uh, and we'll get to this next question in just a second, typically I have heard of quarterly meetings, that seems to be a, a right. usual. Um, Rod, how long a duration are your meetings? Our meetings, uh, they start at uh, nine and typically end at four, and um, you know, the We'll typically do them off-site. Sometimes we'll have one at the company just so that the board members can get familiar with the organization. But uh, 
We like to do off-site meetings, that way there's less distractions. And then um, in terms of content of the meeting, obviously there's a, a full lunch and a break. And what we like to do at our organization is have uh, guests, in other words, uh, Libra employees, join the board at lunch. So we'll maybe add in another five or six people from the company. Some can be management, some can be um, even line workers, because we, we like the interaction uh, of getting these people together. And um, sometimes we'll also have some senior management people making presentations at the meeting. So, Do you ever have an outside speaker of any sort? Uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've brought in some outside people, special mm -hmm. consultants, when we're wrestling with a certain problem. And that's been very effective as well. Let's see, Beck here. A question for the panel. Uh, chairman and CEO versus uh, separate positions. Pros and cons of that on a board. You mean on the board or just just in the organization? Separating the positions and right. chairman and C separating the position on a board of directors. Chairman and CEO, in, in contrast to one position chairman, one position CEO. One person occupying both, or having two people occupy. Both. Alternative. I'm curious. For for those um, who are. Uh, not familiar from where this question is, is coming. It, this uh, splitting the roles of the chairman and the board and the chief executive officer is really the, uh, the flavor of the day uh, at large public companies. Um, I think uh, Jamie Dimon just went through this. He's got other problems, but he just went through this, uh, through this issue at the, uh, at the last annual meeting for uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, uh, I think we, we had one person uh, right down here in front uh, raise her hand when we asked uh, uh, people were uh, uh, with public companies or not. So I, I will take it that the vast majority of the room is with uh, private companies. And, I, and my experience certainly is that this issue uh, just really doesn't exist uh, for, uh, for privately held companies. And that um, perhaps when you get to a very, very large one, you, you would see it. Uh, but for uh, uh, the clients that, w that we deal with, the middle market companies, uh, the chairman and CEO role is really almost universally uh, held by the same person. You know, it's interesting, I agree with what Mark said, but going all the way back to our question about siblings, I have a client who uh, the major shareholder of the company is the father, the son is the president, and the uh, CEO effectively runs the day-to-day -day operations, and the father retained the chairman role just that he had a little bit more oversight. He sets the board agenda and things like that. So it was, it was an interesting uh, situation. But uh, Mark's right, that's the only client I have of a middle market, you know, closely held company where they've separated the chair and the uh, CEO roles. For us, it's a, it's a pretty simple answer. Um, the, the chairman is a Riverside person. The CEO comes with a company, um, but we always have a river. I know of one company, I think of around our 80 companies worldwide, that we have one company where an outside board director actually is the, is the chairman. But just about in every case, a, a Riversider, whether it's a, the deal partner or what we call transactor, the investment person is the chair or an operating partner is the chair. Back there. At least three of you were pretty uh, strong in your recommendation of a board of directors versus an advisory board. I'd really like you, if you could discuss why, what reasons why you're so strong on the director versus advisory direction. We don't do advisory boards, so <laughs> turn it over to the other group. I, I really do think, uh, when I was talking about uh, board of directors for our startup clients who take capital, I was not trying to imply that that's the only way to do this. I think there is a, there is a really uh, important role uh, for uh, advisory boards, and you really just got to you got to look at your company um, and, and figure out really you know what what you expect. How do you run the company? What do you expect from your board? Really, what we what we talked about uh, initially, um, and we have uh, uh, many clients who successfully uh, use uh, advisory boards. The, the typical case that that we see um, is the uh, individual owner. Um, someone who owns the vast majority uh, of the company and is not ready to, to cede even a little bit of control uh, uh, to a group of people, no matter how well he or she knows them. 
uh, but wants to get outside advice. Um, and three or four times a year uh, really looks forward to those meetings, provides the materials in advance and gets the input and then acts on the input that they get. That's typically where we see and, and successfully see the use of advisory boards. Yeah, and I, I'd like to offer my comment. I really think there's room for both, and I think good companies have both. The, uh, the board of directors, I mean, even in a private company, they, they do have some fiduciary responsibilities that they have to take care of. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to also be um, working and supporting the owner or the, the, the president, CEO, whoever, in terms of the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, that's where I really, I think the advisory board can come in and, uh, and help with private companies uh, to offer all kinds of insight and uh, open all kinds of new doors and opportunities uh, for the company. You know, we, we talked a little bit earlier about knowing what you want with an advisory board and maybe going out and seating that board with those specialists, whether it be a financial guy, an ops person, or marketing, whatever it might be. In my opinion, you're not going to get that level of support typically from your directors. Um, but this is an area where I think the advisors can really help you out. They really aren't interchangeable. Um, they're, they're really doing two different functions, and, and they're limited, at least the advisory board is, in what they can do. They don't bind the, the company. They have no legal obligations or duties to the company. So I think Rod's right. You certainly could have both. Um, and uh, I think one of the defining factors is the ownership structure. If you have a company that's wholly owned by one individual or largely owned by that individual and they run the whole show, often they're not interested in a board of directors um, because they don't want to have to go through that process of submitting things to another group. Yes, sir. Um, is there an optimal number that the panel thinks a board of directors should be? particularly if you have one and you're maybe considering expanding it or changing it, and I guess the same as it relates to governance and voting structure. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, I, I, it's a hard question for me to answer. I, I can just give you our experience and my past experience being a CEO in, in other roles. Um, uh, typically, we're at six to eight in that sort of range. Um, uh, you have to understand, though, that that really varies. It can vary significantly, but on average, it's six to eight. Typically, we have two uh, from the management uh, from the company. There's CEO, CFO, maybe a third, and even a fourth. You know, if it's uh, typically the CEO and CFO, maybe a uh, VP of sales, whatever, would be on the board. Uh, two Riversiders. It's just sort of our policy. Uh, so you've got the partner on the deal, and then maybe maybe a VP or an operating person on the on the on the company as well. And then we have a minimum of two outside directors uh, on every company. Those outside directors are very important to us. And those are the ones that we're trying to get some real industry expertise into the company, maybe some management expertise. Maybe they know the management. Maybe they know the company uh, in the past, that sort of thing. So two management team, two Riversiders, two outside, that's six. And it can go up to eight, ten, in, in that sort of range. But that's, that's our experience. Yeah. I, I would agree. We're currently at six. We've over our, our 14 years having the board, we've vacillated between, I think, four and eight. Um, I like six. Uh, other boards that I serve on, um, the number goes as low as four and as high as 10. I think when you get too many people on the board, it's sometimes difficult to get things done. And when you have too few, uh, you maybe don't always have the dynamics that you're looking for. Plus, you also have to remember, even though you schedule these meetings in advance and everybody signs up for them, uh, things happen, so you don't always get 100% attendance. So if your board's too small, um, it really hurts when one individual doesn't show up. And I think just as important as the numbers, um, and, and I agree, we really see that, you know, whether it's a private or private equity clients really do the same thing that, uh, that uh, uh, Ron just described and w when putting their, th their own representatives on the board, but if you strip them out, you're really at the same numbers that, that, that Rod is at. Um, you got to think about the mix of your outside directors, right? Because the, you, you really don't want a board where everybody is just there nodding their head in agreement with the CEO, right? You're, you're looking for input from this group. So, and I'm sure 
Ron Riverside does this when they, when they look at the outside directors. You're really looking for people who will give you that independent view, don't come from the same background um, and, and can and really offer that independent advice that you need uh, for members of your board. What, what, um, what is the most interesting non-traditional skill set that you have found that someone has has put a person on a board that is not necessarily a former CEO, is not an ops person, is not, uh, you know, what kind of non-traditional advisors or directors have you found that have been valuable? Hmm. He surprised us. Hmm. <laughs> well, I can tell you, I sort of alluded to it earlier, it's not the same uh, company. But I have a client that has a, a doctor of psychology on the board, and they look for someone with those, uh, with that skill set in part because they had a fractious board, they had difficulty finding mechanisms to come to agreement, and they were hoping that somebody with that background would help them and bring that perspective to the deliberations. It's the only board I have where that was a criterion for one of the board seats, but that's probably the most unusual. Dr. Phil. Exactly, right. <laughs> Rod, how about you? Well, rather than um, type of person, uh, I think I can relate to getting people from different industries. In other words, my first inclination when I put the board together was, you know, I need to surround myself with a bunch of manufacturing people that know everything that we're doing, et cetera. And um, as we went through the process, I started migrating really to different industries. Uh, non-manufacturing, you know, and, and consulting and some other avenues like that because what I found was all of these experts come at the problem from different angles and to me that was very beneficial. I mean, we know manufacturing and, and we do have some manufacturing people on our board, but we also have a lot of non-traditional uh, types on the board as well. And even though we're discussing manufacturing problems, uh, they still have the, the intellect to attack those problems, but from a different angle than we maybe traditionally would. Yeah, just, just a quick comment for those who think are forming a board. Uh, there is some excellent consulting help out there in the Cleveland area for that, and I'm not taking any away from the distinguished gentleman on the, pan on the panel, because I'm sure they could do a fine job, but there is some good support for that. They come in and do a nice job of making an assessment of your organization, advising you on some of the legalities and so forth. So there is help for that locally. Are stock options a good idea? Or do you think that directors or advisors ought to be simply compensated with cash? You might have a good perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mentioned earlier about stock options. I think it's, uh, I mean, I think it can be fine. It's not something that we, we do regularly at, at Riverside. Um, when we acquire a company, we set aside a certain number of options, uh, an option pool. That's typically for the management team. Uh, and, and we don't uh, uh, typically take that to the board. Uh, but if you have a strategy of compensating the board with stock options, I think that, that'd be fine. I, it's, I don't see any issue with it whatsoever. Um, your, your board members might want a mix of, of stock options and, and cash comp. Uh, you do want their head in the game. I agree completely with Rod. Um, you know, if you want to get rich by serving on one of our boards, uh, it's, it's just generally not going to happen. You know, but we, we do have the ability for you to invest in the company. Uh, not a, a huge amount. We don't want to be diluted <laughs> significantly, but, but uh, you know, we, we do offer outside board directors the ability to invest. Uh, so that's direct equity, you know, at the same terms of, of Riverside. So that's, um, you know, you can consider that in some cases better than, than options. But from my perspective, if, if you want to uh, compensate with options, fine. I, no issue. I don't see any issue with it. And our experience is it really depends totally on the capital structure of the company. So when Take the example that uh, Stan was talking about where you've got the individual owner or someone who owns the vast majority of the equity of the company. We, we tend not to see it in those cases. Uh, there are ways to do it. You can certainly do it with, uh, with, with phantom, uh, phantom interest, phantom stock interest, uh, so the, that individual owner is not ceding any voting rights. 
um, uh, got to be careful of tax issues with those, but th so there are ways to do it. Where we tend to see it and, and use very effectively uh, are the companies where uh, the, the ownership is, is spread out, um, uh, maybe amongst 10 people, 20 people, 30 or more, um, and stock options can be used very effectively in those cases. This is another one of those topics like the uh, splitting the CEO and the chairman's role that seems to go back and forth, the pendulum swings back and forth, um, whether that's a good idea, how many of the public companies are doing it, um, and, and the arguments are always the same, you know, no matter where the current thinking is. Uh, on the one hand, it's great because it clearly ties, uh, the, the hope is that it ties the directors to a longer term view and more closely aligned with the shareholders because now they have something that will increase in value or decrease as the shareholders' wealth increases or decreases. So what about directors and officers' insurance? Um, you know. Clearly, that's probably pretty common for boards of directors, I would guess. Um, but what about board of advisors? Is that uh, a necessary thing? Well, we just spent the last half hour, 45 minutes, talking about uh, advisory boards in part. Uh, and the reality is they don't exist. There, there, there is nothing in, this, in the laws of the state of Ohio that talk anywhere about an advisory board. And as far as I know, there's one state in the country that in its statute even uses the word advisory boards, and that's the state of Mississippi. And they do it. Uh, in the portion of their statute that says that no member of a board or board of directors or an advisory board will have personal liability uh, except in the cases where they don't act in the best interest of the company and in, the, or, and in good faith. So the moral of the story is don't ever be an advisory board member in, for a company that exists in the state of Mississippi because <laughs> if you happen to do something that wasn't in the best interest, you could have personal liability. Uh, I think. My view of it comes back to there is no, uh, there is no uh, control. The advisory board members can't bind the company, but without the, uh, anything in the state statute that tells me that as an advisory board member, I'm in the clear, I would, if I get on an advisory board, I want that DNO insurance. So you think it is a good thing to have? Yeah, we, we have uh, DNO insurance, and it, uh, I meant to look up the cost before I came here, and, and uh, I forgot, but it's, it's a nominal rider on our policy. But it, it covers all the officers of the company, so it, it's all inclusive, and the advisors are spelled out in our DNO as well. And I think that's absolutely the right way to do it. We, I was having a conversation with one of my partners this morning about this topic, and we could not come up with a situation where we would recommend to a client for a board of directors that they not get DNO insurance. <laughs> you get DNO insurance. Yes, sir. From a content uh, Jeff, uh, start, agen start again. Sorry, from a content agenda perspective, what, what do you think is the optimal structure for these meetings? From your Rod, or the optimal Ron? structure of a meeting? Well. What we try and, I don't know that there is an optimal one. Again, it, it goes back to the original question at the beginning of the session, what is it that you're hoping to achieve with the board? So with us, we, we clearly send out an agenda. We, we have a, a nice booklet that we send out. And with every meeting, we have a theme. So in other words, we're, we're attacking a specific problem or issue that we have at that meeting along with a number of other things on the agenda. And that does change, you know, uh, the last couple of meetings it's clearly been growth because that's, that's been an issue for us. But I, I think it really centers around, you know, what it is that you're hoping to accomplish. Yeah, I, I would echo that. Um, and and I, I, can, I can lay out to you how, you know, in, in my humble opinion, how it should work. Um, and, but this, this is, I'm going to tie this back to how, you know, we should be running uh, our companies, you know. And, and so uh, one of the main tenets for us is to have a strategic plan. So we, we try to get that done within the first six months or so of acquiring a company. So you get that down on paper. Uh, we refresh that strategic plan annually, uh, typically around the third quarter, because that helps us in terms of budgeting. Along with the strategic plan, there are tactics to, to deliver each one of those strategies. Uh, so your board meeting 
um, should focus on, in my opinion, focus on that strategy and those tactics. What we tend to do is spend way too much time on the numbers, on the, on the quarterly numbers. Uh, so if our board meetings typically are four hours, uh, four to five hours, if you're spending three or four of those hours talking about the quarterly numbers, uh, then we don't think that's a, a good use of the board's time. Um, we should be spending an hour maybe on the numbers and the, and the rest of the time talking about our strategy, talking about the tactics to achieve those strategies and how well we're doing and what the board can do to help. Um, that's, that's just my own perspective on, on kind of the structure of the meeting without getting into a tremendous amount of detail. Should, should minutes be taken and if so, how thorough and who's responsible for it? I'll take a quick shot at that. It's, uh, uh, we do take minutes, every board meeting. Minutes are taken. Um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it almost always, um, it's the CFO that gets the uh, wonderful job of, of writing up the minutes. Uh, we try to keep the minutes uh, very simple. You know, CFOs uh, are numbers guys. So, that's right, that's right. And that, so they sit there with their laptop and while they're doing the numbers, they're, they're typing in the minutes. <laughs> so we've got that down to a science. Uh, we try to keep uh, the minutes very simple. Uh, typically to one page uh, at the end of the day, um, and then they're forwarded to our legal uh, group. So that's you know, the way we do it. I, I have always thought that this is, is actually a more complex question and one more of art than science, and Ron comes to it from a slightly different perspective because of his ownership group. But if you have a company that has, you know, pick it, let's say 10 or 20 shareholders, then you really want to think about those minutes for a couple of reasons. One is the minutes are available to the rest of the shareholder group who aren't on the board. They're also discoverable in litigation. And so what you put in there, I think you really want to be thinking about what if someone else is reading these in a different context. So there's sort of two ends to that spectrum. One is you want enough in there where you have shareholders who are not also board participants that will demonstrate to a third party that the board is fulfilling its fiduciary obligation, that they're considering things, they're taking the time, here's the questions, here's the thought process. Ron's right, you don't want too much information in there, but you want enough to protect the board. At the other end of that spectrum is you don't want so much in there that you're hoisting the directors on their own petard. Um, so it's, I think it can be a real question, and it also revolves around the particular issue that's being addressed by the board. For example, you know, part of the fiduciary duty is uh, the disclosure of conflicts, the duty of loyalty. So when a director comes to the board, as they should, with a potential personal conflict, you want to be sure the minutes show that that was vetted and discussed um, and, and a reasonable process was gone through to evaluate that. So it's, in my mind, it's a little bit more art. Rod, do you yeah, take we, minutes? Yeah, we take minutes. They typically end up being two to three pages. And then uh, we also uh, distribute those minutes to all the board members. So it's basically it's just an accounting of here's what happened. And, and in many cases, within those minutes, contain the action items that will be taken between now and the next board meeting. Let's make a distinction again here between board of directors meetings and board of advisor meetings. Correct. And ours, I'm right. speaking from a board of advisor standpoint. Yeah. And, and I think the. Uh, from the director's perspective, it's really universal, I think, the, when, when the minutes are taken. On the other hand, for advisors, it's not universal. In fact, what, what, we, what we'll tend to see is that CEO almost in those cases takes it upon him or herself that, to hold themselves accountable for things that are discussed and that they'll promise to deliver at the next meeting. But that's really to the, the extent of what uh, of a so-called minute for that meeting may be. In a, in a board of advisors, what kind of what kind of issue typically requires a formal vote? Or do you, do you take formal votes, Rob? Yeah, we, we don't have any formal votes. I mean, what we look for is a consensus with the board. If, say we want to, we're looking at a specific project and we're thinking about taking action. Um, again, those people are there to advise you. You're, you're free to accept or reject their opinions. It's really critical to keep in mind, and Mark was referring to it in his comments just a moment ago, the distinction between these two boards. Again, they're not interchangeable. Uh, a board of advisors, uh, except maybe in Mississippi, have no legal obligation to the company. And so there's nothing that uh, they would take a vote on, except maybe when they're going to meet again or something like that. Boards of directors, on the other hand. Completely different. 
Um, and then we've talked about it. They have a fiduciary obligation to the company, to the uh, shareholders as a whole. Um, you would typically take every major decision of the company to the board. They would have a formal vote, and um, you would reflect that vote in the minutes. Should materials be distributed in advance? I, I think that almost might be uh, Absolutely. <laughs> a pretty obvious <laughs> answer. How much material do you send in advance, Rod? Well, we, uh, we put together the booklet, and the booklet is, um, there's, there's a lot in there. It com contains all the financials, uh, management reports. Uh, but in addition to the booklet, periodically throughout the month, I or my president or other people will send out via, typically via email, what we think is pertinent information. Like sometimes there's background information on our industry or some specific trends going on. And you know, the board members are, are free to read it or not. Um, everyone has different levels of interest in terms of how far they want to get into the company. So we're constantly feeding information out to the board to kind of keep them on top of what's going on within our industry and the business. Should um, managers or family members be on the board? Yeah, I mean, in, in our case, it's, it's quite typical. I mean, you know, we're, we invest in the smaller end of the middle market, for those of you who, who know Riverside. So it, we're, uh, you know, the, the vast majority of our acquisitions are from founder-led companies or family member businesses. And so it's very typical for us to have um, uh, a couple of family members on the board. Again, if you're in an executive position, it, just because you're a family member that's sold doesn't, uh, you know, in our view, entitle you to a right to be on the board. And most of them don't want to be. You know, it's the ones that, that are really in the executive positions that will be on the board. So it's very common for us. Okay. <clears throat> this is your last chance to take one last short question. Otherwise, we are uh, going to be a journey. Uh, yes? <laughs> Are you talking about family councils where they're advising the family outside of simply just a, a corporation or a business enterprise? I don't think that mic is on. You're going to have to shout. Okay. Well, there oh, there it goes. I'm wondering, just in terms of advice that's being given to business owners and family businesses, I was wondering in the context of boards of, um, uh, boards of directors, boards of advisors, family councils, Things such as that, yes, I was just wondering if you would speak to that as a form of providing insight and, and advice to, to the business. You mean specifically to family-owned businesses? Yes, I'm sorry, to family-owned businesses. And I think Rod hit on this in his experience before, but I, again, this is, a, this is a case where I think getting an outside perspective uh, trust people that are trusted uh, by the family and not necessarily just the, uh, the leader of the family, but the other generations, I think can really be uh, invaluable in helping with the day-to-day -day issues that the business is facing, the strategic issues, and ultimately the, the, the transition of the business. You really, that's something you want to get ahead of and not uh, uh, let it sneak up, uh, because then when, they, when it sneaks up, it's often not a pretty situation. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in thanking the panelists.